Operation Unthinkable. World War III, 1945. Finally, peace had descended over Europe when, after six years of bitter fighting, World War II was over and hostilities had ceased. The Axis forces had been defeated and work to rebuild the devastated infrastructures could begin. But while most people were looking forward to an age of peace and prosperity, a dark perspective was looming over their heads. The British military were forging a plan to attack the Soviets. If it had gone ahead, the conflict would have indeed given rise to World War III. During a speech in Parliament, the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill declared that, if Hitler invaded hell, I would make at least a favorable reference to the devil in the House of Commons, in a remark suggesting that Stalin was the lesser of two evils when compared to Adolf Hitler, when Germany attacked the Soviet Union in 1941. Up until then, the British had stood alone in the war against the Nazis. The German attack in the East turned the Soviet Union into an ally to the British. Indeed, if it hadn't been for the joint efforts of the Allies on both the Eastern and the Western fronts, the Germans might have never surrendered. The Soviets were precious allies to the British and the Americans, and vice versa. However, as the war was coming to an end, the relationship between the Allies was becoming strained. Germany was on its knees, and Churchill's well-known anti-communist sentiment had manifested itself again. The idea of Soviet domination over the entirety of Eastern Europe struck him with horror. It was Poland that bothered him the most. The United Kingdom had entered the war because of the Nazi invasion of Poland, and it was a matter of principle to ensure that the Poles could still live in a free and democratic country. In 1945, the country was occupied by the Red Army troops. Even though Stalin had promised free elections, it was obvious that the country would just become one of his satellite states. This was something that Churchill just couldn't come to terms with. He said, Terrible things have happened. A tide of Russian domination is sweeping forward. This constitutes one of the most melancholy events in the history of Europe, and to one which there has been no parallel. It is to an early and speedy showdown and settlement with Russia that we must now turn our hopes. As the war was coming to an end, Churchill considered the idea of starting a new war with the Soviet Union, one that might lead Stalin to listen to the will of the Western Allies. So in early May 1945, Churchill tasked his military commanders with devising a plan to attack the Soviets in Poland and that would include the Allied troops still present in Europe and even utilizing the remnants of the German Wehrmacht as part of his force. He even set a deadline for the attack to July 1, 1945. As unthinkable as the prospect of war with the Soviets was, the British military strategists approached the task seriously and considered all the possible options. The feasibility study of the attack was codenamed Operation Unthinkable. The document was presented to the Prime Minister on June 8, 1945. The plan was based on a rapid assault on the Soviet troops in Poland, similar to the 1939 German Blitzkrieg invasion of Poland. The Allied attack would be in two main fronts, one along the stettin schneidemühl bidgost line and the other along the leipzig cottbus poznan breslau line. Taking into consideration that a certain number of units would be necessary to police the occupied territories, British plans predicted the participation of 47 divisions, including Polish troops, and 10 divisions of the former German Wehrmacht. The stratagem anticipated that the attack would push the Red Army troops back to the Oder and Nysa rivers. The outcome of the operation would depend on one great battle, probably a mainly armored one. In this battle of battles, the British and their allies would certainly face heavy odds. It was unlikely the strategists further assumed that the war with the Soviets would be finished in a short time. A victory in a clash on Polish territory could force Stalin to come to terms with the British and the United States regarding the fate of Poland. The total defeat of the Soviet Union would call for a total war. A conflict of this scale would probably have spread beyond the boundaries of Central Europe and would include the whole of the rest of Europe, the Middle East, India, and the Far East. 
But now let's dedicate a moment to thank our sponsor, NordVPN. Are you feeling unprotected using public networks? Do you want to feel safe, but not at the cost of speed and responsiveness? Look no further. With NordVPN and its latest feature, Threat Protection, your digital security will jump to the next level. NordVPN is now more than a regular VPN. By using Threat Protection, you get a totally new layer of browsing privacy, as it prevents websites from tracking you, and it also guards from malware. Once you enable it, your identity is hidden and your browser history is secure. Customizing your protection level changes just by toggling between these options. Browsing with NordVPN Threat Protection is one of the easiest ways to overcome blocked online content, whether it's a website or a streaming service that's not accessible in your region. This VPN service ticks virtually every box you can imagine with its robust protection and high speeds. I recommend you try Threat Protection yourself. You won't regret it. Go to nordvpn.com slash simplehistory or click the link in the description to get an exclusive discount on the two-year plan plus a 30-day money-back guarantee to try NordVPN risk-free today. To secure a victory in such a war, the Western Allies would have to either decimate the Red Army to a size in which any further resistance would be futile, or destroy the economic and industrial might of the Soviet Union, making it unable to sustain the war. Most likely, both conditions would have to be met. For this to happen, the Western Allies would have to penetrate into Soviet territory as far as the Ural Mountains, further than what the Germans managed to achieve in 1942. The Soviet strategy in this war would probably be a defensive one, with them making full use of the vast terrain and severe weather conditions. The same obstacles that had defeated both Hitler and Napoleon before him when they tried to invade Russia. On the other hand, the British would also have to pay attention to the defense of the whole of the British Isles. The Soviets might not be capable of conducting a seaborne invasion, but they were capable of carrying out massive rocket attacks from across the other side of the English Channel. Apart from the tactical and strategic issues, the critical question was, did the Western Allies have the fortitude to win the war? Undoubtedly, they enjoyed naval and air superiority. Britain and the United States had become masters of the sea during World War II, while the Soviet Union only had an ineffective fleet left. However, supremacy on the seas meant very little, as most of the Soviet industrial installations and communications infrastructure were positioned inland. Also, most of the fighting would have to take place on the ground. The Western Allies were also dominating the skies, even though the Soviets had more tactical fighter aircraft, 11,802, compared to the Western Allies, 6,408. The British and the Americans had a far larger strategic bomber force, 2,750 aircraft against the Soviets, 960. The Western Allies were better organized and equipped and were more capable of utilizing their air force, which was also going to be an advantage. However, in the case of a long, drawn-out war, the Air Force's full potential would gradually be depleted as casualties were taken. The real problem for the Western Allies was the Soviet supremacy in the sheer number of their land forces. As mentioned, British plans had anticipated the deployment of 47 divisions to fight against the Soviets. The total strength of the Western Allies in Europe in July 1945 was 103 divisions, of which 23 were armored. On the other side, the Soviets had 264 divisions, which included 36 armored ones. That was two and a half times more soldiers than the British and the Americans had combined, even if they included the Polish and German troops in their force. Undoubtedly, the Soviets' huge resources of manpower would affect any British plans to defeat them. Such a superior ratio was estimated only if the United States didn't withdraw its troops from Europe. The war in the Pacific was still going on, and the Americans needed every single soldier to defeat the Japanese. Also, the Americans were reluctant to start a fight with the Soviet Union while Japan was still putting up such a stiff resistance. Even after the defeat of Japan, there was little chance that the British and American soldiers had the will or the strength or motivation to fight another war. World War II had lasted for six years, and men were reluctant to fight another conflict without a proper reason. The British economy as well would not be able to withstand another long and costly war. In the end, the document dubbed Operation Unthinkable concluded that the result of a total war with Russia was not possible to forecast, 
but the one thing certain was that to win, it would take us a very long time. On July 5, 1945, the United Kingdom's general election was held. It brought changes in the political parties and the leadership of the country. Prime Minister Winston Churchill was replaced in office by Clement Attlee. As a result, the wartime Prime Minister had to step down and forget about his ideas of fighting a war against the Soviets. The British government kept the Operation Unthinkable document a secret, even from their closest allies, the Americans. After the war, Churchill made no reference to it, not even in his memoirs. It was declassified only a half a century after in 1998. It was only then that the world got to know how close they had been to World War III.